This week on Overtime, we end our PATH series with a deep look at what it means to put on the full armor of Christ. You don't want to miss this one. Make sure you like, subscribe, let's get it. Welcome to Center City Overtime, a weekly podcast where we take a little more time to dive into Sunday's message. And um, this was a good one. Um, if by good you mean long, yeah. I mean both. It was both. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. It was it was a lot to take in. So we're wrapping up our series on path. And um, I can't actually remember what you titled it because my head is so full of all the details. Strong steps. Strong steps. So a lot of it was about the armor of God, which if you grew up in church, this was one of my like memory things that we had to work on was memorizing the armor of God. It was also one that for whatever reason, like, I have a strong mental block and I can never remember every piece on the spot if you ask me, but, um, but I've never had it tied into something like path where we're, we're not really talking about like fighting. We are talking about fighting, but it's more like how to live in your day-to-day life. Why do you think armor is important in that stance and not just when you're like in the middle of a huge spiritual warfare battle? Yeah, so I think what compelled him to this passage is he begins it with this conversation of uh, being, well, let me just read it so that I make sure that I get it right. But he says, be strong in the Lord um, and in his mighty power. So, of course, Paul's concluding this letter to the church of Ephesus, and this is his final words. And I know, like, when you're at the end of the conversation, you know, you just kind of like, all right, I am going to now regurgitate everything that I said, yeah. everything that I wanted to say. I'm just going to like kind of spill it out. And I feel like Paul is spilling out right here at the mm-hmm. end. But the reason I'm so drawn to this idea is because um, to be strong uh, in the Lord and his mighty power, I just had this this picture of people taking really strong steps. Mm-hmm. I think to your point, because we've been talking about this so much uh, over the last month, so many people are focused on the destination, the big battle, the big thing they're going to overcome, um, that this was a reminder that God is, of course, engaged in every step. Mm -hmm. And and what does it look like to walk in this place that I can be confident every day, not just for the big battles, but legitimately for our everyday? Yeah, I'm kind of like what he's doing in our everyday is preparing us for what we don't necessarily know. It reminds me of um, the story of David, actually, like, Early on in David's life, before he fought Goliath, one of the things that he said when he was getting ready and they were like, you can't fight this giant, it was, I've been taking care of my sheep forever. I've fought lions and bears. Like, mm-hmm. of course I can do this. And it feels kind of like that same thing. Like David with the sheep fighting the lions and the bears is the same idea as Absolutely. us wearing our armor every day, taking strong steps every day. It's kind of been the crux of this conversation. Like, really, the we started with this idea that if we are just faithful to allow the will of God to be about our everyday mm-hmm. journey, the destination is this beautiful product of the will of God. Not because there's this one moment where it all kind of comes together, but because every moment is putting it together. Yeah. And, and we don't, be, if we're faithful in the in taking strong steps. We don't have to be so overwhelmed with anxiety for the big moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you um, you got into kind of what it means to put on armor or to put on a uniform would be more kind of what we would think in this day and age. And one of the big things that you talked about was a French term, yeah. esprit de corps, yeah. um, which sounds to me like a perfume, but it's not. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> could be. It may be. Come to Center City in the fall. <laughs> Everybody gets like t-shirt designs and merch <laughs> drops. We're going to do a perfume <laughs> drop next fall. Based on <laughs> military uniforms. A group of sweaty soldiers. <laughs> that doesn't make you want to show up. What will? <laughs> um, but talk a little bit about this concept as you take a sip um, of esprit de corps and what that means when someone puts on a uniform. Yeah, so the idea of esprit de corps The literal translation of that is spirit of the body, Mm -hmm. um, which is perfect because, you know, Paul speaks quite a bit about how we collectively are a part of a body Mm -hmm. and that we're individual parts. And we don't always do the same things and we're not designed the same way, but we collectively come together. Spirit at core, the concept is, is that the individual's. Um, the individuality of the moment is lost and we take on the the purpose and the intention and the, the kind of the morale of the group. 
Um, the the best way that I could picture it um, is in schools of fishes, and I watch wait, wait uh, schools of fish, not fishes. No, they're both they're actually both correct. Right. As a grammar nerd, fish and fishes, yeah. both words now. Uh, <clears throat> but in schools of fish, um, there's this moment where when they're being attacked, whether it's by a shark or whatnot, they move in this beautiful um, in this beautiful symmetry in order to create kind of a sense of confusion for the enemy mm -hmm. um and i'm just I, I love that picture that as the body of christ again back to paul i no longer live um it means that i take on the identity of the children yeah. of god that we're this this moving walking kind of talking um a tool of the kingdom of god that can advance the kingdom so yeah that's kind of what that concept and you said this in first service so i don't think it's on the recording but this phrase is at where we actually get the phrase team spirit. Yes. Which for me with like no military background, it was actually easier for me to picture this concept happening when someone puts on a football uniform. Absolutely. And I remember my brother when he played, um, he, had, he had a great coach. But one of the things that they did that was unique at the time is they would not let the players put their last names on their uniform because his whole thing was when you put on that uniform, you're representing this team. It doesn't matter who you are as a person. So as you're kind of explaining that yeah. concept, that's what I was thinking about. Like, oh, this was Coach Johnson, like yeah, <laughs> not, not letting my brother have his name on his uniform. Absolutely. And and that kind of ties into what we've been just kind of dealing with for a long time culturally. We live in such an individualist culture. Like what we've been taught is normal to the point where we don't even think about it is no, it is about like your name. And now with social media and everything. It's about building your brand and, yeah. and what kind of coach would not let you do that because that's where the money is and that sort of thing. And I know we're not all professional athletes, but we still kind of have this mentality of like, I need to figure out my voice. I need to figure out who I am, how I'm distinguished from everyone around me. But this idea of esprit de corps is really like, that matters. Like you don't need a body full of all people who are being hands. Yeah. Everyone needs their unique role, but at the same time, like the body is the thing. Like absolutely. Does that? I feel like I'm not making sense. No, but that's you absolutely. You've <laughs> you, you absolutely nailed it. Like within the context of our culture, we have made the individual the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. So it becomes about my individual preferences and my individual taste and my 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 in the way that the, the way that I'm wired. And what we've said culturally is, if the pinnacle of culture is individuality then it means you have to quote unquote live your truth and figure out who you are and what that truth is above all things and it flies in the face of a biblical truth that says no i no longer live right so christ lives in and through me and then he turns around and says and p.s you are part of this collective body where if you become so obsessed with what your role is to the point that you're almost villainizing the other roles of the faith and mm -hmm. other positions in the body, it it becomes toxic. And that's that's really where we are culturally right now. We've allowed um, these things that, uh, that quote unquote identify us to separate. Mm -hmm. So how would you say, like I'm, I keep thinking about our next steps process and our move series. And one of the big things that we encourage people to do that move series the one of the reasons is that we really talk through how to figure out their own unique gifts mm -hmm. so how do we walk this line where we're not all trying to be exactly the same but we're also not trying to like tell our individuality it's it's not as complicated when you consider that the gifts work in concert with each other mm -hmm. we need apostles prophets evangelists shepherds and teachers where we become Kind of my, my senior pastor in um, in Fort Lauderdale used to always say there's a uh, there's a uh, a level of growth that becomes unhealthy. Like we often we often say like well healthy things grow yes but so do tumors mm -hmm. right. So what he always pointed to is a church that is obsessed with one gift or a a, a church that's not activating all the gifts can can become tumorous like it yeah. becomes toxic to the nature of the church as a whole and I, and I mean that across the board so no if, if you realize that as an apostle as an evangelist as a shepherd as a teacher that is that me operating in my gifts is to benefit the whole of the church 
it, it actually fits really well in surprise. Um, the, the biblical way of doing things actually works, right? Like that's not <laughs> Who knew? every, every great corporation, every, every, every successful business will tell you that they have different people doing different things. And the moment, you know, some of the downfalls of the greatest tech companies in, in the last 20 years is because you know, engineers have gotten crazy or your, your R and D department is just going nuts. Like there has to be that beautiful balance of shift where everybody is focused on, on the objective and moving forward. Yeah. That's such a good reminder. Um, so kind of want to move on a little bit cause you got nine pages of sermon notes. There's a lot. Um, but you talk about knowing your enemy and this was a part where you kind of had to rush through in the message, the things that we know about our enemy, do you mind like kind of slowing that down and talking a little bit about who our enemy actually is? Well, the, the writer says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So sometimes to know who the enemy is, the, e the simpler thing is to know who he's not. Mm -hmm. And who he's not is flesh and blood. Yeah. So if you wake up in the morning and your target of vitriol and passion and I'm moving against this thing has a heartbeat, according to what we read in the passage, your focus is wrong, mm -hmm. right? Again, I think sometimes we have a tendency of making enemies out of the people we don't like or the, the agendas we don't like, losing sight of there's something behind. And it's something that, again, was taught to me at an early age in the faith journey is the enemy is often behind the thing that, that rubs against you wrong. Um, and, and so, again, he's unseen. Um, and then a couple things about the enemy that we just know is, is first of all, he's a defeated foe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when Christ from the cross says it is finished, um, it is finished. Um, how death in the grave is busted wide open we know the results. They've already been reported. Um, I said it Sunday, but the ticker tape parade has already happened. We, we're we not living in overtime. I think that that's a bad perspective. Our enemy has already been defeated. So you have the victory. Well, John, I don't feel like I'm a victor. You just stole my next question. Oh, sorry. Right, keep going. <laughs> what if someone doesn't feel like they're a victor? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it it means that there's... there's um, there's probably just that you, you're not fully living in the news of the victory. That sounds crazy, but for a moment, like we just um, are celebrating Juneteenth this Monday. Mm -hmm. Was it two and a half years later that people were actually free? No, they were actually free for two and a half years. They just didn't get the news, mm -hmm. right? And I, I don't. I hate to minimize and, and compare because sometimes it, it gets lost in that and I'm not trying to by any stretch of the imagination, but so many people are living in this place of bondage when you don't have to, then it's, it's already been written. So if you're not living in that place of victory, there's some things that you need to change. And according to, again, it's got to start with the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's where the spirit of God comes in and then begins to give you new perspective as to what's around you, what you've been walking through, and walking as a victor or walking in that victory means that you're going to have to tell yourself some things that you know versus what you feel. Mm -hmm. uh, and so much of that is difficult. So again, uh, we're jumping all over the place, but that's what an intimacy of the word. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're not living in victory, you need to pick up your word and read about the victory that's already been won for you. Yeah. Um, a consistent prayer life. If you're not living in victory, you need to hit your knees and, and pray that God would reveal that victory and come against those things that's trying to rob that victory from you because it's all they can do right now. They can't go back and change the score of the game. The only thing they can do is convince you that you didn't win. Yeah. And I actually think you can kind of put those together. Like one of the most helpful things for me, and I teach this freedom class every year, um, is to find those things that you're struggling with. Like find, find the promise from the word that speaks to whatever that is. And then start by praying that back to God. Like sometimes we don't know exactly what to say when we pray and and it's always enough just to say Jesus honestly um but if you start by praying back the words of scripture to God it's such a great place to like just something supernatural happens in that moment where you meet with God speaking his word where you can own that like I say deep in your bones because it goes beyond your ability to understand Absolutely. um so that that would be a first recommendation because the reality is like 
we can say we have a defeated foe and we act absolutely do, but it doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. Oh, no, no. And I think that's where we can get mixed up sometimes. It's like, well, if the celebration has already happened, if the parade is over, why am I still struggling with X, Y, or Z? It can be internal or external, but very real struggles. So what would, what would you say to encourage someone who feels like, man, the enemy has been defeated, but I feel like I'm getting blow after blow right now of really serious, difficult stuff. Um, so I'm going to be careful with how I phrase this because I think it can be taken out of context. So if you want to take it out of context, this is where you hit record. Um, <laughs> the work of, of the victor is the work of spoils now. Right. So now our job is the work of telling other people that they are free. Okay. Right. Blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. Right. Yeah. That that's our that's our job. That's our that's our priority is to now sound the alarm that victory has been won, that you no longer have to live in bondage. You don't have to live in you don't have to live um, uh, broken, that there is a pathway by which God um, sent his son to restore the relationship between you and the creator. If you're at a place where you're still struggling with that concept, um, often, again, it's, a, it's that constant reminding yourself that your circumstances does not change the fact that the victory has already been won for you and for others. It doesn't mean that there's not an enemy trying to pull back and, and take everything he can and hoard. And we know that the enemy is uh, like a lion looking to who he may devour. He's on that prowl. He's Again, so much about the enemy we know. It, it's it's lies, it's deceit. But to live in the truth of that victory means that I'm going to subject all of my dealings to this idea that he's already won. Mm -hmm. So um, I will also tell you, though, in 2023, there is this heightened sense of victimization that people tend to embrace the identity of a victim. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just going to tell you, uh, you're an overcomer. That's your identity. You're a child of the most high God and to live as you're not and to allow yourself to be subject to self-inflicted chains of limitations, that's on you. And you need to get to a place where you are hitting your knees. You need to get to a place of accountability. You need to get to a place where you're having open conversations with people you trust um, because there's like that, that idea of a victim will absolutely tear at your core. That is not who you were created to be. It's just not. And again, the victory's already won. So I know that that's a lot, but I feel like maybe if you're watching and you're sitting in that place consistently, then maybe you've put on the identity of the victim and it's time to, to remove that. Victim. Yeah. The, I haven't thought about this in years, but in college, I took this medical sociology class. And one of the big concepts in that was the people, what happens when you have patients who don't want to get well? Yeah. And that there's this whole kind of grouping of people who become so used to walking through life with that identity of I'm someone who's sick, that they don't know what to do. They're afraid of that healing. And I, I think what you're speaking to can be that we can, we can wear these bad things that happen both those things that we bring on ourselves and the things that because of the sin in the world, you did nothing, you did nothing to bring that on yourself. And yet the reality is we have a God who heals. We just have to choose not to wear that sickness if we've been healed. Does that make it? Absolutely. Sorry, I keep saying, does that make No, sense? It, it absolutely makes sense. <laughs> I, I really think that there is to some degree a larger issue culturally because also we're trying our hardest to separate ourselves and one of the ways that we separate ourselves is the ugliness of our trauma mm -hmm. so we wear our trauma like a family barbecue t-shirt right because that's going to separate me my background is worse than your background my my scars are deeper than your scars if i find healing for those scars they don't bring that same value anymore um so I, I'm not saying that's all people, but there are a lot, and specifically in 2023 with our just hyper kind of deifying of individuality that, yeah, it becomes a modifier and we grab a hold of that. Yeah. So you, you talked through some great stuff. If you haven't watched the message, watch it, because I'm about to skip over a lot of pieces of armor. You talked about the belt of truth. You talked about the shield of faith. But I want to settle for a minute on the sword because you made a really good point. A lot of times we think about armor, 
we're only thinking defensively, like this is how I stand my ground, but we're actually called to live offensively, not offensively. <laughs> They're spelled the same, but <laughs> um, so you talk about how um, we're given kind of two weapons or just a weird pairing at first glance of this helmet and the sword. Yeah. What is Paul talking about here? So the helmet is really about the mind because the, the helmet protects the mind, right? Like it protects the head. And if you go back to our origin in Romans where we kind of started this conversation, he says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if you're talking about it in your personal life, one of the offensive tools that God uses to, to, for positive advancement in you is your mind, the renewing of your mind. And I believe, and biblically, I think we can, we can um, have a solid defense that he uses the tool of your mind often to bring transformation to others yeah. in the way that you talk and in the way that you serve and the way that you love all kind of starts in our mind. We, we, we tend to remove so much of that to our heart. And I'm not saying that passion is not important because it absolutely is, but passion without the mind to filter and process can be dangerous, okay. right? Like, so the mind is a critical offensive weapon in the kind of the tool set of the believer. And he's saying, you need to protect that thing with your salvation. Like you just got to know that what you feed that mind, it, there's a tendency you are either building it mm -hmm. as a tool by which you can expand the kingdom of God, or you're kind of dulling that weapon of the mind. So I think Paul is really specific when he talks about the offensive to start with the mind. Yeah. And then you got a sword. Yeah. Not a sword. Not a sword, but a sword. <laughs> you can't say that both ways like the other word you know, we talked about earlier, like fishing. That's fishing. a pronunciation issue, not two that. separate words. Um, but the word, uh, the idea of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Um, and then he ends with this idea of prayer. I do, and we said this Sunday, I don't think this is one and one a, I think this is one weapon, right? Um, because I think it's the word of God in concert with prayer. Um, but you like, you have to know your word. We are, we are beyond this. I, I know it's 2023 and you can poke up your phone and flip and hit a button and everything pops up. But you got to know your word. You, you just got to become familiar with the word. There's got to be an intimacy between you and the word of God um, in order for it to be the guide to every one of your steps. So if we're moving forward, if we're advancing the kingdom of God, it's because we got to hold on the intimate or we have an intimate hold on on the, the words of Scripture and what it means to us. I see that so much in the story of the temptation of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because what you see there is that Satan comes at him with scripture because it's taken out of context. But Jesus is so intimately familiar with what that scripture says and what it actually means in the bigger picture of scripture that he's able to just like defeat those lies and temptations that Satan's throwing at him but it is a little bit like weird at first when you look and you're like wait satan's using yeah and i think it's important because i think there's a practical step here for my bible scholars and nerds there is a tendency sometimes when we talk about the word for you to get hyper focused on one part mm -hmm. what jesus does is he brings out the truthful context by looking at the whole of scripture not just one right. passage which i think is a beautiful example for us as believers because often we get fixated on our, you know, our three or four passages to defend our idea or our thought versus a good overall understanding of the whole of the word of God, because Genesis and Revelation work in concert. Right. They don't work in contradiction. They work in concert. And if you find contradiction, it's because you haven't done the work of understanding the whole of scripture. So I think that's a beautiful, sorry, I didn't interrupt your point. You're fine. I, I love that, that picture of how Jesus is bring, he illuminates what, the, the inaccuracy of what the enemy is trying to communicate through the word by bringing the whole of scripture into the conversation. Right. No, you're missing the point. Right. And that, love. that might sound overwhelming to you just to think like, I don't even know how to find a verse in my Bible if I'm not on my phone. How am I going to know the whole of scripture that well? And, and I would just encourage you one step at a time. Like Absolutely. Jesus, as a kid, his parents couldn't find him because he was in the temple like you're not going to start knowing the whole thing, but just start a little bit every day and you'll be surprised 
how quickly you just make connections. Well, and, and again, to, to, to go back to the passage, he says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the spirit of God illuminates the word of God. So like some of this is your relationship with Holy Spirit, right? Some of this is your relationship with um, the part of the Trinity we don't talk a lot enough about, we can talk more about the part of the Trinity that many of us are kind of weirded off by. But the more you engage in the relationship with the Holy Spirit, quite honestly, the more scripture is illuminated and he works to remind you of the things that you study, which I love. Yeah, I love that too. Um, okay, we're wrapping up past. Do you have any like kind of parting wisdom, what you want people to take away from this series? Um, honestly, I, I, I feel like if you walked away more assured. Walked away, sorry, yeah. just like on path. Yeah, I mean, that was the point. That was that. <laughs> now you know, good job. And uh, <laughs> if you walked away taking stronger steps, I think we've won. Mm -hmm. I think this series has been valuable. If you walked away taking stronger steps in your marriage, uh, I, we can't ask for anything else. Is what we've been praying that we would strengthen uh, marriages, that God would work to strengthen marriages through this series and through our intensive and, and just kind of putting the work in. If you sat down last week and were inspired by Pastor Ashley's incredible message on singleness um, to take stronger steps in the season of singleness, we've won. Like the the message is, was was worth it. If you walked away from this conversation being assured that you can take stronger steps and, and kind of stepping into that and encouraging, encouraged to take stronger steps in the armor of God. We've absolutely, like that's been the intention of this series. I would just now challenge you to take stronger steps. Like don't take all this in only for it to be a moment. Rather take this in in order for it to affect each moment after. And that would be my hope that we're a year from now saying, man, look what God has done. Look where he has brought us. Not because we are so fixated on the destination, but because with every step we were faithful to allow the will of God to be revealed and we followed. Yeah, I love that. Okay, we're starting a new series next week. Yeah. Are we are we saying what it is? I mean, you're, that's up to you, but I'm excited, so... Well, we're starting a series called Broken Crowns. Can't wait. And we're going through the books of First and Second Kings for the rest of the summer and really focusing in on the bad kings. I can't, this, I've never done this before. <laughs> like, I feel like we're, yeah, it's for all the villains in, yeah. in, in, in First and Second Kings. And we're not going to get all of them, but we're going to get a Yeah, a lot of them. And really learn from their mistakes and also point to the one true and perfect king in Jesus. So gonna it's going to be great. We'll be right here Sunday, 9 a.m., 11 a.m. We cannot wait to see you then. Mm -hmm.